Can we tell the band thank you for doing what they do for us? Amen. All right. A passage of scripture that's meaning more and more to me all the time is 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Some of you are familiar with it. It's a passage that describes the sons of Issachar, this great tribe of ancient Judah, the sons of Issachar. It says that they understood the times and they knew what Israel had to do. And beloved, between COVID-19, the current Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the teaching of the scripture regarding the end times that we're living in, the church better understand the times and know what to do about it. I'm afraid that we, like ostriches, have our heads in the sand instead of being like doves filled with the Holy Spirit and advancing the kingdom of God. That's where we've got to be. We've got to understand the times and know what to do. So tonight, I'm going to give a much-needed big picture. Turn to your neighbor and say, big picture. This is big picture stuff. I'm going to give you an overview of what's happening in the world today and how... It's going to lead into what happens in the world tomorrow. Now, not just tomorrow. I'm talking about the future. But we're going to take a big picture look. Here you go. This is going to be broken up into three sections. And I want to give you advance warning. The first section is the longest one. So if you're going, oh, my gosh, we've got two more after we got done with that. You'll be okay, I promise. <laughs> Plus, I have an event to get to. <laughs> three sections. We're going to talk about end times conditions, end times conditions. We're going to talk about end times countries, and then we're going to talk about end times composure. Those are going to be our three different sections, okay? Now, let's jump right in here and talk about end times conditions. What are things that are going to be happening in the end of times? And I'm, I'm not even here to to try to convince you that we're in the end of times. We've been in the end of times for 2,000 years. What happened on the day of Pentecost, Peter said then, right? This is that which the prophet Joel said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So we've been in the end times for 2,000 years. If we want to even jump forward a little farther, the apostle John in 1 John says that we're actually in the last hour. So if we were in the last days in the last hour 2,000 years ago, we're like in the last seconds right now. Now, seconds on God's calendar, if a day is a 1,000 years, a 1,000 years as a day, our seconds could be decades. I don't know. I'm not predicting the future. But I'm saying we are living in a time where the Bible talks more about it than any other time in the history of mankind. We live in a very exciting, very sobering time, and the church, again, has to understand it, and we've got to know what to do. So here you go. The end, the end times conditions. The world, beloved, is heading toward globalism. You may have heard the word globalism or globalization. Globalism. Here's what globalism is. It is the attitude or policy of placing the interests of the entire world above those of individual nations. Now, if you just read that at face value, it's, it's, doesn't that sound nice? Doesn't that just sound like a kumbaya moment where we're just going to put the needs of the world above and beyond the needs of an individual nation? We're all going to hold the hands and sing the old Coca-Cola song, whatever that was. I just want to teach the world to sing. See, only old people laughed at that. You just gave yourself away. But it just has this feeling of globalism. Why can't we all just get along and hold hands and drink Coke and sing songs and just, you know, make sure that we are all sharing and all on the same level and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, friends, the globalism that this world is running toward is beyond dangerous and detrimental. We have to understand that uh, uh, about our times. Now, if you pay attention to any of this stuff, you should see it being played out like right in front of you. It's on full display. Nobody's hiding these things. The globalists around the world are making much of their plan. This isn't even in secret boardrooms anymore filled with thick cigar smoke. This is like all over the internet if you'll just know to look for it and where to look for it, okay? So the great reset of the World Economic Forum. 
The Great Reset of the World Economic Forum, okay, you can go to their website, weforum.org, uh, if you want to uh, understand some more. I want you to see who's in charge of the World Economic Forum. It's a guy by the name of Klaus Schwab. He's a German man well into his 80s now. He started it in 1971. Do we, do we have a picture of Mr. Schwab that we could throw up there? Can you see? Oh, there he is, yeah. I want you to notice what's, what's there behind him. Committed to improving the state of the world. Now, isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that sound great? Except when you're talking about godless atheists who have a godless atheistic plan. Right. See, but if we just label it something sweet and soft and teach the world the same, then it's, you know, it just makes it more palatable for everybody. But it's not palatable, friends. It's something that we need to understand that's going on out there. Um, I found this interesting. Klaus Schwab and it has... The World Economic Forum has taken advantage of uh, COVID-19, at, at least they've taken advantage and maybe they've even contributed to the spreading of it. But what's our next Klaus Schwab uh, quote and picture? He said, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine and reset our world. The World Economic Forum is fully taking advantage of what's been shoved down our throats for the last two years to implement their satanic plot and plan for the entire globe, okay? We've got to wake up to this and understand this stuff. This global reset, if you will, or great reset as it's been called by them, will lead to things such as the global digital identity. Now, if you've read the book of Revelation and you understand about the mark on your hand or your forehead or whatever, you might go, oh, is, Steve, is that what you're talking about? Maybe, but something like this, something like this, global digital identity, get a load of this, friends. They're pushing for an ID that encompasses all of your personal, medical, financial, social, and telecommunication footprint. In other words, it gives the globalists the opportunity to know every single thing about every single thing that you do. And see, this is presented in a way that it's, this is going to be better for all of us because we just want to improve the world that we're living in. And so let's just know everything because like, you know, if you ever got really sick or something or you were somewhere, and so let's just make sure that we are able to immediately identify these things about who you are and what's wrong with you and, and how we can help you because that's what this is about. We just want to help everybody and let's move into the digital world and make sure that we can help everybody as easily and as quickly as possible. So global digital identity is one of the things that's out there right now that's going to be being pushed. That then leads to our next scary and sobering thing, which is called alternative credit scoring. Now, some of you might be familiar with what's happening in China right now, where everywhere you go in China, they're taking pictures of people. Now, Pastor Steve, have you fallen off of the ledge? Are you one of these crazy conspiracy guys now? No, no, no. Because remember, yesterday's was conspiracy is today's reality. And so what happens in China is going to lead the way for the rest of the world unless the United States of America and specifically the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ stands up and says, not on my watch. So this alternative credit score, and here's what this looks like. Banks will take an individual's social behavior not your credit behavior, not whether you pay your debts on time or not, but they're going to look at an individual social behavior, both what you put online and offline. They're going to take that into account for the crediting process to see whether they want to loan you money or not. They're going to leverage big data to analyze not just your financial histories, but your social behaviors. The World Economic Forum's digital identity scheme is what's going to lay the foundation and prepare the way for this global social credit system to happen. And then what happens, it gives them the power to control citizens and punish those who they deem untrustworthy. This is like happening. 
It's being planned. It's being talked about. This isn't conspiracy stuff. You just go to their website and look at their books and understand what they're talking about in Davos, Switzerland, when they have their yearly meeting. Right. See, here, here's the thing, and I've fought this for the last 28 years of living in Middle Tennessee. I love where we live. It's wonderful. It's prosperous. It's a fantastic place to raise our families. But I'm telling you, friends, it lulls us to sleep. And we forget that outside of the bubble of beautiful middle Tennessee, there is like wacky, crazy stuff going on to turn this entire world into a globalist world led by elite globalists. All you have to do is pay attention to it. Now, although Klaus Schwab and his Friends of the World Economic Forum would like the world to believe their goals are to improve our health and our overall well-being. What they really intend to do is dominate human beings, dominate you and I, on a global scale. That's what it's about. So you pay attention to when you see globalism, globalization, when you hear things about the meeting in Davos, Switzerland that happened in the World Economic Forum. Man, please just pay attention. Understand the times and know what to do. So it's not just what we watch happening around us. What I just described to you is what the Bible said is going to happen. Globalism, what does it produce? What's ultimately, what's it going to produce? It's going to produce a one world government. That's the goal of it. Globalism, one world government. Guess how many leaders ultimately will be in the one world government? One. There'll be a one world leader. The Bible calls him, among many other names, the Antichrist. I'm not here to preach tonight, friends. I'm here to teach you something. I'm here to let you know what's going on so you can understand the times and know what to do. There's going to be one world leader. His name is the Antichrist. He's not one of the many Antichrists, Antichrists that John talked about. He says there's been many, but there is one coming who is the Antichrist. And it's how we know that it's the last hour. Daniel, when he had his vision in Daniel chapter 7, specifically verse 8, it talks about the Antichrist who would come at the end of times. He's called the little horn. And, and what does it describe him being like? That he is pompous, he's arrogant, he's blasphemous, he speaks against God, his word is will in his way, and he, listen to me, he wars against the saints. It says very specifically that's what he's come to do. He's warring against the saints. Now, why would you think if what we've talked about with globalization, globalism, and a one world government with a one world leader, why would he be warring against the saints? Because the saints are the only people warring against him. Everybody else has drunk the Kool-Aid and is deceived beyond belief. And it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that says, we're not going along with you for your godless, atheistic, humanistic plan to create a better world where in reality you want to be God, but we already know and love and serve God. And you're not him. God finally destroys them. Hallelujah to Jesus. In the New Testament, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 through 8, it describes this Antichrist leader again. And what does it say about him here? It says that the whole world is going to marvel about him. And uniquely, three times just in Revelation chapter 13, it says these interesting words that he had a mortal wound upon his head that was healed. What's up with that? Ty, why would it say that three different times in one chapter? I can tell you what most people think about it. It's going to be a deception to try to prove that he was resurrected from the dead. And he's going to pretend to fulfill the prophecies of the resurrection of Jesus himself. Everybody marvels at him. 
He's got a mortal wound to his head that was healed. It says that he's invincible. Everybody looks at this last day's leader and says, what about it? Who can make war with the beast? Another one of his names. He seems invincible. Everybody follows him. He has all authority over every nation, over every tribe. Everybody will worship him and worship the image that's made for him. One world government with a one world leader. What's next on the list in globalization and globalism? A one world religion. Anybody want to guess how many leaders there are of the one world religion? One. What's his name? His name is the false prophet. He is recorded in the second half of Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. And what does it say? He causes everybody to worship the beast. But he also operates in such supernatural power that he calls down uh, thunder and lightning and fire from heaven. And he's filled with signs and lying wonders, lying wonders, deceptive wonders to try to convince people that they have the power of God, of God himself. It says that he goes on and deceives. He creates an idol of the first beast. And that then this one religious leader is going to come and he's going to put a mark on people either on their right hand or on their forehead. We know of this. Many of us do. It says that you will not be able to buy or sell unless you show your vaccinate, vaccination card. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not that. You cannot buy or sell Unless you have the mark. Unless you have the mark. The number of the mark is the number of a man. 603 score and 6. 666. We're not here to talk about what the potentials for that are. I'm just letting you know we are heading in a big picture way toward globalism with one world government and one world religion. And it's exactly what the scripture says. It's exactly what the scripture says. I want you, listen, I don't want you to get lost in the minutia. You know, there's fun rabbit trails to go down every once in a while. Just don't stay in the hole. Come back out. We have to have a working knowledge of the big picture plan of God that's revealed in the scripture. So you have to ask yourself the question then as we move on here. How does the world get to the place where a one world religion and a one world government happens. How do we get there? What should we be paying attention to? Here's what I'm calling this. How do we get there? How does the world get there to this place? It is through a created chaos. A created chaos. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 38, Jesus talks about the sons of the wicked one. And the sons of the wicked one are planted in the field of the world. And they are planted in the field of the world in order to grow up so that they might oversee and execute Satan's godless, deceptive agenda. That's what this is about. So they create chaos in order to find a diabolical solution to man's problems that they themselves have created. When you look at Matthew chapter 24, and again, I'm, I'm giving you these scriptures, these things, I need you to read them on your own. We don't have time for this. Matthew 24, 3 through 13, shows us a picture of the created chaos, the end times conditions, things that are going to be going on. I've looked at this list, and I'm telling you, in the last two years, it seems like many of these things are just on absolute warp speed. The first thing that Jesus talks about, a condition of the end times, is deception. Deception. It's the, it's the defining characteristic of end times theology. Jesus talks more about deception happening in the last days than any other topic. It's the most repeated. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Paul writes and says, the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, 
signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous, what? Deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. What happens here? Mankind says, we don't want anything to do with God. And they say it so long that they suppress the truth, Paul says in Romans, in unrighteousness. And finally, God says, all right, you don't want the truth. You don't have the truth anymore. And now what's going to happen is God says, I'm going to send you strong delusion that will even keep you from being able to receive the truth. Oh my gosh, God wouldn't do that, would he? Yes, he would. Ask Pharaoh. Pharaoh, harden his heart, Pharaoh, harden his heart, Pharaoh, harden his heart. And what did the scripture say? God finally, the scripture finally says, God hardened Pharaoh's hearts. Men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They don't love the truth. They want to embrace a lie. God sends deception. God sends delusion. And then all of a sudden, they are beyond hope because of their own commitment to wicked unrighteousness. Deception is going to be a key playing factor in the end times. Next, we go on quickly through this list. Wars and rumors of wars. I used to read this years ago before COVID and thinking, yeah, okay, wars and rumors of wars, that makes sense. But when I started thinking about it created chaos, I thought, you know what? Wars and rumors of wars do a Jim Dandy uh, way of creating international instability. And if we can have international instability, it just helps to usher in one world government and one world religion. Next, it says... Most of our translations say nation shall rise against nation. That's not a good translation. The word, the word in the Greek is ethnos, ethnicities. He's talking about races. He's talking about races being against one another. What is that going to do? Create distrust. We've seen that over the last couple of years like crazy. What is the media doing constantly? What are godless people doing constantly? Trying to pit us against one another? Critical race theory. I'm going to do a whole thing on this at some point, but critical race theory. It is so diabolical. It is so unbiblical to the core where we now have to fight against, listen to me, kindergartners, white kindergartners being taught that they're evil because of the color of their skin. Are you aware that that's happening in the world today? Are you aware that somebody's got to stand up and say, I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's hateful. That itself is racist. That's not going to get us anywhere but creating distrust amongst each other. Kingdom against kingdoms. What does that do? It creates tension. Again, all of this is, is a created chaos. Rulers of nations warring against one another, playing games with people's lives like they're nothing. Famines. You go, well, Steve, famines, that's a natural thing. No, famines are not just natural. Famines are man-made, beloved. Let me tell you three things that create a famine, that creates a famine. Corruption in government mismanagement of resources, and instability in a nation. Those three things will create famine as much as anything else. Right now in the world today, as we sit here tonight in a wonderful air-conditioned, well, not too comfortable chair, but as we sit here tonight, listen to me, northeast Nigeria, southern Sudan, where I've been twice and have many friends there, Somalia, Yemen, eastern Syria, where I've been, Burkina Faso and Tigray in northern Ethiopia all right now are on the verge of famine. Why? Not because of lack of rain, but because of instability and corruption and mismanagement of resources. Pestilences. <laughs> Anybody know anything about pestilences? Last couple years? I remember sitting in Israel when the word first broke. We were one of the last planes out of Israel 
when the pandemic started and the pestilence of this thing called COVID-19 was going to hit the world. I remember sitting, talking to my friend who's in the Israeli government and he said, Steve, what do you think about this? And I knew in my nowhere, he said, you think this is out of the wet markets in, in uh, China? China, do you think it's in those from those uh, <laughs> wet markets? And I said, no, I don't. I believe it's going to come out that it's 100% man-made. It came out of the Wuhan lab. And uh, sure enough, uh, although most people aren't admitting it, plenty of people know that to be a fact. Yeah. Pestilences. I heard somebody tell me the other day, I, I, this, this blew my mind. You want to know what power looks like in the United States of America? Here's what power looks like, Larry. Power is an unelected yeah. official yeah. Yeah. who's 80 years old, listen to me, telling people how to breathe. Right. Yeah. That's power. Yeah. Now listen, I, I, my heart goes out. I've got friends that went to heaven as a result of COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm belittling any of that, but I'm just saying, you watch and see, COVID-19 was nothing more than a primer to see what they would get the rest of us to admit to. You want us to stay locked up in our houses? Okay, we'll stay locked up in our You want us to put a diaper on our face forever? Okay, we'll put a diaper. Oh, you mean the diaper doesn't work? Okay, but we'll keep it on because you tell us to keep it on. Oh, okay, you want us to jab ourselves with things that, we're, that we stand against and we're just going to go along with the program here and people are dying like crazy, but nobody's talking about the people that are dying from the jab. Oh, but people who got the jab are still getting sick and they're getting other people sick, but let me just keep sticking me, just keep sticking me. Booster number one and booster number two and booster number three and booster number four. Pestilences, earthquakes. Now, earthquakes, you know, you can't create an earthquake. I guess if you blow up a big enough bomb, you could. But you can sure capitalize on earthquakes. Mankind can. Tribulation, Jesus said. It can, it's going to create martyrdom, hatred, and persecution. Jesus talked about it clearly in Matthew 24. He said, because of these things, many are going to be offended. What it means is the world has gone so crazy and is so mad and we're so fed up and where is, listen to me church, where is God in all of this? I'm so offended by God's lack of activity or apparent lack of activity in our circumstances that my faith is offended. You remember when John the Baptist was in prison, what happened? He sent his blokes to ask Jesus, are you the coming one or should I look for another? Because I'm in stinking prison right now because of you. And are you going to come through for me or not? Jesus said, you go back and tell John. The blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk. Oh, and by the way, blessed are you who's not offended because of me. Right. Offenses in the last days, offended with one another and offended with God. How many people have been offended by someone or something you said just over COVID? Loss of relationships because of the election or whatever. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. Offenses like crazy. But specifically, what does this kind of offense create? It creates an apostasy. And it, it creates a loss of people's faith. And when people lose their faith, it contributes to chaos. Personal chaos, and the more people that lose their faith in any nation, national chaos. And the more people that lose their faith in a nation, world, global chaos. Betrayal. Betrayal creates distrust. Who can you trust after you've been betrayed? Let me tell you something I've learned about betrayal over the last year. Yes, you have. Betrayal happens for at least three different reasons that I know for sure. One reason it happens is over jealousy. Another reason that it happens is for personal gain. Another reason it happens is for self-preservation. I will betray you so long as I can keep my little world. Jesus said betrayal is going to be happening. It's going to be a condition of the last days. Lawlessness is next on the list. Lawlessness creates lawbreakers. 
Lawlessness is the result of not enforcing the laws. And so we have borders that are open. Come on in, everybody. Now, those of you who are coming in, you don't need the jab and you don't need a test and you don't need a diaper on your face. But a f- <laughs> real live citizens, they sure do. And let's start taking these people and putting them in strategic cities around the nation so that we can register them as Democrats so that we can try to win in the future because America is waking up and standing up and saying enough of this demonic democratic agenda. No more. Now, before you get upset with me for saying that, listen, forget personalities. Just look at platforms. Just look at, well, I think both platforms, you know, have some things that are wrong. This, listen to me, this isn't about the number of things one has wrong over the other. It is about the weight of things that are wrong with one more than the other. Those balances, that scale is so tipped in one direction about things that God hates. Why in the world would we support that kind of platform or agenda? God forbid that we do it any longer. Finally, Jesus said that love grows cold. It's going to be a sign of the time because lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. When love grows cold, it creates hopelessness. Again, which contributes to chaos. A loss of love for God and a loss of love for man. When that happens, beloved, beware. Because this world is going in a bad direction. So the created chaos, here's what it does. It leads to the need for a godless, satanically inspired political and religious system to emerge from the sea of humanity to improve the world's condition. That's that's how this works. So those are end times conditions. One world government, one world leader, one world religion, one, one world false prophet. The conditions specifically of Matthew 24, man, look around. Just long enough to educate yourself and be aware of what's happening, please. So there's a general overview. We need to understand these things. Jesus told us in advance so we wouldn't get caught off guard. Now I want to get a little more specific. I told you the first section was the longest. Can I get an amen? Amen. I told you I have to hurry up and leave. Can I get another amen? Let me get a little more specific with you. An astounding portion of scripture that is being talked about a lot lately that details an end times geopolitical alliance between several countries that are in today's headlines. So let me talk to you about end time countries. Ezekiel chapter 38. Anybody guess I was going to go there tonight? Ezekiel 38, and really it goes into Ezekiel chapter 39. 2,600 years ago, 600 years before Christ, the prophet Ezekiel sees things and God reveals things to him about the latter times or the end of days. And so in Ezekiel chapter 38, the prophet starts talking about a man by the name of Gog, G-O-G, which many people believe will be the Antichrist. Gog is from the land of Magog. Magog includes the ancient tribal territory. We've got lines around nations these days that they weren't lined like that hundreds and thousands of years ago. So we have to go back in history and look and see where these tribes functioned and lived and operated from. This land of Magog, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, it is Russia, Ukraine, Turkey. These are known as the ancient Scythian peoples. They came from the north and the east of the Black and the Caspian Seas. All of the other Stan countries from Central Asia all the way over to China. So we're talking about a huge swath swath of people from the far north. The scripture goes on in Ezekiel 38 and talks about ancient Persia, which today we call Iran. Ancient Ethiopia, which geographically today we call Sudan, not southern Sudan or south Sudan, but Sudan in the north. Ancient Libya. 
It's northern Africa, all across the northern tip of Africa, but it excludes Egypt in this list. Gomer and Tagarma is eastern Turkey all the way over to Azerbaijan. And so, friends, when we look at this geopolitical alliance that is going to come together in the last days, we have to keep our eyes on what Russia, Turkey, Iran, Sudan, Libya, and the surrounding countries are up to. We can't just look at this and go, oh gosh, look at what Russia's doing in the Ukraine. And oh my gosh, that's horrible. And this is horrible. I'm not making light of it at all. Innocent people are dying right now. Why? Because Russia's hungry. And Washington is weak. That's why. So the question comes up, is today's war between Russia and the Ukraine the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39? Could it lead to the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39? Listen, we don't know, and anybody who tells you that they do know doesn't. Could it be? Sure, it could be. But because I want you to understand the big picture of things, I want you to understand that that war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 with those countries is coming and we need to know about it. We need to pay attention to it. We understand the big picture. These things are going to be happening. In the fall, September specifically of 2014, I was having a conversation here in Cool Springs with a very, very influential senator. And this was when the whole ISIS thing was was really becoming public and they were trying to figure out what to do. And I asked him, I said, uh, hey, what kind of briefings are you getting on these people? Because like what they're doing is religious and spiritual in nature. Like this isn't political. ISIS isn't political. ISIS is religious. It's spiritual in nature. He looked at me and he said, nothing. We get nothing on who these people are and what motivates them from their religion to do what they're doing. This week, just a few days ago, I was in Washington, D.C. with some congressmen. And I said, guys, I got a question for you. What do you know about Ezekiel 38 and 39. What do you know about the end times? What do you know about Russia and, and, and the, the geopolitical alliances of the end days? What do you, what do you know about that? And they said, we, we don't know anything about that. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I would love to get as many congressmen as I possibly can in one room. Let's not make the mistake we made with ISIS. Let's get as many congressmen in the room as possible and let's do a detailed Bible study of what God said is going to be happening. And let's pay attention to that. Would anybody be in favor of that happening in Washington, D.C.? All right, end times condition, end time countries, and now end time composure. Because we need some composure, beloved. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 19, when he's talking about all of these things happening in the end times, he says these six powerful words. By your patience, possess your souls. When you see all of these things happening in the world, by your patience, possess your souls. It just means be composed. It means don't freak out when you see these things happening. Don't lose your faith. Don't start hating people. Don't start betraying people. Don't let your love grow cold. Endure to the end so that you can be saved. By patience, possess your soul. Don't have a come apart. Jesus said, behold, I've told you these things in advance before they've happened so that we really can know and understand whether we get all of it or not. We get this. He's on the throne. He's not surprised. And he's coming back. So we live with composure. Luke 19, 13. Next, what do we do? 
He said, you need to do business. It means to occupy until I come. It means, God forbid, that the church make the same mistakes that so many made in the 70s and early 80s. Well, Jesus is coming back in 1988. And, you know, that's 40 years after Israel became a nation in 1948. And, and a generation is 40 years. And so that means Jesus is coming back in 88. So let's just put on our rapture shoes and get our rapture position ready and get ready to go. <laughs> to hell with the lost world. Who cares about them? Run the credit card bills up. No need to go to college or send my kids to college. Jesus is coming back. 1988, I remember the guy that wrote the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. You remember that, Larry? Remember what book he wrote in 89? <laughs> 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 89, and the 89th reason was because he didn't come back in 88. <laughs> Do business, occupy, Jesus said, until I come. Don't just look at all these things and say, oh, who cares? It doesn't matter. I don't need to do anything and God's will is just being worked out so I'm just going to eat, drink and be merry. God forbid. We've got to be about our Father's business. We've got to be salt and light. You've got to get involved. Do something. I've only got a few ideas that you could do. Good night. Run for the school board and get that crap there jamming down our kids' throats. Out. Somebody run for the school board. Somebody run for Congress. Somebody run for Senate. Somebody run for President. Somebody do something. Improve your marriage. Improve your parenting. Start downloading gospel into your kids and your grandkids. Act like you care. Act like this thing has eternal consequences. And get engaged. Turn the TV off and pray. Read your Bible. Share your faith. Act like this thing matters. Finally, Luke 21, 28. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, these things I've discussed, the conditions, the one world government, one world, when you see these things, what did he say? Then look up, lift up your heads for your redemption is drawing near. We are seeing things that the world hasn't seen ever before, and we are alive to see it. Understand it. Know what to do. Here's the three words I want to leave you with. Work the harvest. Watch world events and wait for Jesus. This is a really good balance of things. Work the harvest, man. Get engaged. Start sharing your... I just, I just want to tell you little things to give you some ideas. One of the things Sarah and I have been doing now for years, you know how easy it is to tell your waiter or your waitress, hey, we're getting ready to pray over our meal. And I love, you got you to joke with them a little because they get freaked out sometimes. You have to say, now, listen, we're getting ready to pray right now. And you only get one thing. Not you, one thing. You just give me one thing that we could pray for you about. I've never been turned down and I've watched tears fill waiters and waitresses' eyes and have them look at you and say, oh my gosh. I was walking through TSA in Dallas last week and through crazy circumstances, I ended up in front of this precious woman at the exact same time I was getting ready to say to her because I felt prompted of the Spirit. Hey, how can I pray for you? She said something else to me and we overlapped each other. I wanted to make sure that she heard what I said. So I asked her again. She looked at me, y'all, like she had been hit by a, 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 a frying pan. And she said, why, why are you asking me this? I said, well, I just, I'm asking you, how can I pray for you today? I want to pray for you. She said, you need to pray for strength for my family. I said, all right, sis, we'll, we'll do it. Went through the metal detector two different times, random beep, 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 beep thing, and finally went over here to get my roller. And I turned around after getting my roller. She's standing straight behind me. She left her TSA pre-check station and came and was standing right behind me. She goes, you rocked me. 
I want to know why you asked me that. I said, here's, here's why. I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit say, this girl needs prayer. I said, that, that's what, and you know what that's like. She goes, I didn't feel any nudge. I said, I know, I felt it for you. <laughs> and she was just flabbergasted. And she's just like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I don't even know what to say to this. That easy. I'm not even telling you that you need to feel a nudge. Just do it because it's right. And watch and see how God will start using you in people's lives, man. This is what it's going to take. Let's just be faithful in little things. And just see if God won't make us ruler over much. If he won't entrust us with greater opportunities. Work the harvest, watch world events, and wait for Jesus. That's my message for us all tonight. I'm so glad you all came. I I, I hope you are. This will get posted. You can share it with your friends. Please share it with your friends. Pay attention, y'all. Pay attention. Amen. I'm going to get my tux on. If you hang around for about 10 minutes, you can see me looking like a penguin in about 10 minutes. God bless you all. Thank you for coming tonight. We love you. Thank you.